He's telling us about, let me just teach you that. Let me get that to you. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 11. I'm just going to teach you. We're going we're gonna to have a little fun here. We're going to have a little fun. I have this vision in my spirit of an onion being peeled. It's an onion being peeled. And what God is saying about that is that in Him there are many layers and realms. Realms and layers that if you don't seek after God and allow Him to lead you and to peel back a new layer, you'll only be stuck with the experience of the layer that you see. There are realms in God that are deep and wide. There are realms in deliverance, there are realms in knowing what's going on in the spirit realm. We have the benefit of some experiences in the Bible where the Bible says, Paul testified of a man, whether in the body or in, out of the body, I cannot tell. He talked about a man, how he ascended into the third heaven. That means that this man, whoever this man was, went to heaven. And communed. We read the book of Revelations. We know John had such an experience. And we know all the things that he saw up there. Creatures that looked like lion. Creatures that looked like a man. And they had wings. And all kinds of creatures. Creatures that looked like a calf. The worship in heaven. 24-7. Holy, holy, holy. How God is worshipped day and night. Ezekiel saw, no, excuse me, Isaiah saw a glimpse, and Ezekiel actually saw a glimpse as well. Isaiah's experience testified of seeing angels who worshipped so loud that heaven, the temple in heaven shook. how powerful their worship was. And let me tell you something. When you think about the temple in heaven, how big it must be for not only God to be in that place and a manifested glory as capacity. Now, we know God is much bigger than even that heavenly structure, but one, you have God in that place and then you have an innumerable multitude of saints and angels all in the same temple. You can imagine how big the place is and yet the angels that are worshiping, their voice is so powerful that it shapes the building. That's extreme. That's power. The point that I'm trying to make is that there are realms of God. Deep realms. Realms of wisdom. Realms of counsel. Realms of knowledge. Realms of understanding. And God is desiring that we begin to peel the onion. To see what new layers we can discover. God has put an onion in each and every one of your hands. And you know what that onion represents? The part that you see is your current experience with God. For some of you, it's understanding the 23rd Psalms and believing it. For others, it is, I see demons. I see spirits and I cast them out. For others, it's laying hands on the sick and getting some moderate level of success in seeing healing, healings. 
biblically speaking, on the day of Pentecost, they received power to speak in languages of the earth that they never knew before. Power. Who here in this place has walked on water? That's a realm of God. Who here, like Enoch, tasted, vanished, and was not able to taste death as a re result of it? That's a realm. That's another layer of the onion peel back. Oh, you discovered something. Wow, I'm about to vanish. It's another layer. I'm telling you, there is nothing more exciting than God and this onion that he has put before you with so many layers to pull back. I've heard stories of people who had sons and daughters that were, that were missionaries. And the parents would be troubled in their spirit and would start to intercede for their child. And they would pray and pray really hard. And then when the child and the parent come back together and the parent would mention, you know, such and such day, I was, man, I felt a strong urging to pray for you and I prayed for you. And the child would go on to mention, it was at that time we were in a near-death experience. And we got away freely. That's also biblical. Remember the saints that were praying, praying for Peter when he was in prison. They had that whole prayer meeting because this man of God was locked up. Who stirred them? Who caused them to go into intercession like that and caused another believer who was distressed to get free? Because of the intercession of another group of saints. That's another layer. To know when somebody else that you love is in trouble and you don't see them. And you never call them. But you know something is wrong. And you go into intercession. That's another layer. To be like Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. His body turned into what appeared to be like lightning. Countenance changed. And all of a sudden, you, you start seeing spirits. Men that were dead. Moses and Elijah. Full conversations with them. That's an experience. Multiple layers. This Bible is full of them. Samson, the Holy Ghost come on you. A lion come up against you. You catch the lion with your bare hands and tear him. That's the Holy Ghost. That's another layer. I read about the seven spirits of God, and one of them is the spirit of might. A man catch a lion and tear him with his bare hands. Because the Bible says the Holy Ghost came on him. That's ridiculous strength and power. So, there are layers of God. God wants us to begin to encounter these layers. So I'm going to take you through John chapter 11 because there were layers of his glory that he wanted to reveal to his disciples and to his friends. And his friends not only had the benefit of this, but a couple of other people. 
I'll tell you something. God will peel back the layers of glory, not just to his friends, but people that don't believe in him. Why? Because he's trying to save them. And this is, this is what God will begin to do from time to time. And I believe by the Spirit that he is doing it and ready to do it. Verse 11 of chapter 11. I'm going to skip around because I want to get you out of here in a timely fashion, but I'm going to share some revelations with you. <clears throat> now a certain man was sick. His name was Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Now these, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were brothers and sisters. Jesus resulted to this house on several occasions. They treated him very well. They served him. They sat at his feet. They really honored and respected him. And Jesus went there. And that's a revelation in itself. You want Jesus to live in your house, so be careful with how we treat him, all of us. And it says, and it was Mary which, anoint, which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest, and again, they had an established relationship, and it was understood you love this man, is sick. And when Jesus heard it, the sick, he said, the sickness is not, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And when you read John chapter 12, you understand how that glory was manifested. Multitudes of people came to Bethany just to see Jesus and Lazarus. And when they got to Jerusalem, multitudes came to see Jesus because of what he did with Lazarus. The scribes and Pharisees said, we need to kill Lazarus because everybody believed in this man because of this miracle. And so that there was... There was a glorification that occurred because of this miracle. Now, this onion where the Lord began to pull back this new revelation when he says this sickness is not unto death but unto the glory of God and all of us know the story, Lazarus died. This new layer that began to be pulled back started first with no word. It started first with a word. So what am I saying to you? When God is getting ready to pull back a new layer or a new onion with you, it's going to begin with a prophetic word. It's going to begin with revelation that you are going to begin to see in your Bibles when you are communing with God. Pay attention if for the past few weeks it just seemed like the Holy Spirit is inviting me to study deliverance. Maybe he's pulling back at me later. Or for the past few weeks I've seen how uh, Jesus was healing the blind. He's pulling back at me later. It's an invitation that began with a prophetic word. So pay attention to that. You can't be discouraged when bad things in life happen. Because sometimes those bad things are also invitations. If you're looking at your life and you're saying, I'm troubled about it. This experience was extreme. Their brother was near death. As a result of that near death experience at that time, they sought the Lord. 
And then when they sought the Lord, they received a prophetic word. Sometimes circumstances of life is the catalyst that brings about the invitation for you to peel back a new level of For Saul, it was the losing of the donkeys that led to him being anointed as king. It was never about the donkeys being lost. It was always about you finding Samuel who would show you your destiny. So when, I, when a problem arises now, now I understand even through this prophetic word that maybe God is trying to pull back a new onion. A new realm. Maybe he's trying to show me something a little different. This problem has arised. I mean, think about it. We don't get the benefit of seeing Samson and his strength except the children of Israel were bound, slaved, or being persecuted, or were captives subject to the Philistines. As a result, where the new layer is being pulled back from glory. What a problem led to it. So, what am I saying to you? Sometime, if God permits a problem to arise, maybe he's inviting you to prayer so that he can give you a ticket to reveal some new level of glory. And he's going to begin with a word. God uses problems to push us into the prayer closet. Because otherwise, sometimes we just wouldn't come. Everything is perfect. I don't need to pray. We go about our businesses. We, we are doing our thing. We had work. We had the kids good. We had the game. Oh, my team won. Who prayed? When it's like that. When that brother is sick unto death, that loved one that live in your house, All of a sudden, famine has hit the land. We don't have what we need, seemingly, to survive. We go into the closet and we receive a prophetic word. And that's what they got. So, if you have a problem in your life, maybe it's an invitation to get a prophetic word because God wants to peel back the onion and show you a new level of glory about yourself. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. And when he heard therefore that he was sick, he abode still two days in the same place where he was. Now, Jesus, the Bible had to clearly specify that he loved them. If God don't show up initially, when you pray, and when I say show up, I mean bring resolution to it, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. You can have a prophetic word from God and still see everything get worse. Did you hear what I just said? You can have a prophetic word from God. Problem arises. I go in. God wants to show me a new level of glory. I got in through the problem. He gives me an answer, and yet I still see things get worse after having received the answer. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. And there are a lot of people that have received prophetic words, but things are still getting worse. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that the, perfect, the prayer wasn't heard. Remember, you received the word. You just haven't seen the manifestation of it. And you haven't seen the manifestation of it because God is trying to show you something different about himself. You hear what I'm saying? Sometimes this journey of discovering God is a difficult one. Because we get tested in it. I get a word and things are getting worse. I don't see God moving, but I know he heard me because I heard what he said. 
And this Bible gives us the benefit of knowing that God will do this to you. And even though he didn't fix your problem, but he spoke to you. All is well. Whatever it is he spoke, well, you're going to be healed. You don't see no change after having heard that. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. He still loves you. Now, verse 7 should give us comfort because the Bible says, Then after that, he said to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. And his disciples said, to him, Master, the Jews as of late sought to stone thee. Thou goest thither again. Now, when he said, Let us go into Judea again, that means that there is an appointed time for him to show up. That means you received your word of deliverance. When you received that word of deliverance, God gave you a ticket that said, I'm going to show up on your case. Because he cannot lie. And if God speak a word to you, he is going to show up and do what he said he was going to do. Even if he waited. And again, you may be in that place where you receive that word, but things are progressively getting worse. But we know this in verse 7, Jesus said, let us go into Judea again. That means when God gave you that word, he is going to show up on your case. You just don't know when it's going to happen. He's coming now. That's why when you get a word from the Lord, I don't care what's going on. And all hell seems to get worse and worse and worse. And it, everything is all but destroyed. I had a word. He going to fix this. I heard it. The disciples was a little nervous. They say, man, Jesus, you know, Jesus, they wanted to stone you lately. Jesus said unto them, Are there not twelve hours in the day for man walk in the day? He stumbled not. But if he seeth the light of this world, he stumbled not because he sees the light of this world. He said, Okay, there are twelve hours in the day. A man, if he sees the light of this world, he's not going to stumble. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbled because there is no light in him. Now that's pretty, that's, that's kind of funny, right? You know, Jesus, you just got to, you got to, you got to have spiritual ears when you're dealing with it, right? I tell you about the Jews getting ready to stumble, and you're telling me about daylight and not stumbling. And how, if I walk in darkness, I don't have no light in him. That's your answer to we about to be stoned if you go back. What did he mean by that? Here's a revelation. Jesus is telling them that I am moving in light. I am being led by the counsel of God. So when I say let us get up and go into Judea, I am saying that because God said it's time to go. And if God's word is leading me, what does the Bible say? His word is a what? Lamb. To my feet. And it is a light to my path. And so even when the Jews say, I'm going to kill you if you come back in this city again, if God say now is the time to go into the city, they can't touch you. That's why he said, but if a man walk in the dark, he stumbled because there is no light where? In him. You're walking in darkness if God is not leading you where to go. And if you can't hear his voice, then you can't fall if you go in some place that you go into without him having sent you there. Look at the disciples he had to deal with. Watch this. Now he just gave them that revelation of light and all that. He goes on to say, these things said he, after he said, after he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I might wake him out of his sleep. Then the disciples said, Lord, if, if he be asleep, he doeth well. How be Jesus spake unto him? He spake of his death, 
But they thought that he spoke that he was taking rest. And then Jesus spoke to them praying that Lazarus is dead. Now let me finish my other point. Remember I was telling you about the light and the darkness and all that. Verse 16, because Jesus said we're going to Judea. One of his disciples, it was Thomas, verse 16. Then said Thomas, which called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, said, Let us also go that we may die with him. Did you hear what Thomas told the other disciples? I just told you, Jesus, they're trying to stone you. You're going to go tell me about day and night, and now I'm not going to stumble if I walk in the day. Oh, man, you got to go to Jesus. Let's go with Jesus and get stoned, stoned with him. They didn't even understand what he was saying. Jesus was telling me, I'm being led by the light. No one can come to me. God told me to do this. They didn't get it. Man, it's Jesus, man, telling us about daylight, not talking about stoning. Let us go also go that we may die with him. <laughs> Verse 15, Jesus said, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent that you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. He was peeling a new onion back. Mm -hmm. Let me see how much time I got. Oh, let me go ahead and land. I'm, I'm at 30,000 feet. I need, to get, I need to start descending right now. Okay, let me wrap this up real quick. I'm about to skip around, but I'm going to show you some good verses before we land. All right. So they head on over there towards Judea. Judea um, to get to Jerusalem, and Bethany was very near to Jerusalem. You find that in verse 18. So they come to Judea. Jesus meets Martha, which is um, Mary and Lazarus' sister. And when it happens, uh, let's skip to, uh, well, verse 17, we find out what happened. Then Jesus came and he found that he was laying in the grave four days already. So Lazarus died. They received the word, the sickness is not unto death. And that's exactly what Lazarus did. He died. <clears throat> But it's unto the glory of God. So, the Bible says in verse 20, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she also met him, but Mary sat still in the house. And then Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But now, even, but no, even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give it to you. And Jesus, she sets herself up. And we all like this. She says, you know what, Jesus? You sent me a word, and my brother died. <laughs> you see, you know, we sit there with all that pain in our eyes, looking at the blood. <laughs> the job didn't come through. The man left me. You said it was going to work out. And my cousin said he was going to be here. I laid all hands on him. I prayed in tongues over him, and he still died. You know, if you came when I called you. This would never happen. Really, we want to say, this is your fault. Yeah. <laughs> this is your fault. <laughs> but we ain't got the nerve to say that. <laughs> Don't dare say that. Ever. <laughs> Always be respectful to the Lord. So listen. So the Bible goes on to say, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know if you ask him, Whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Jesus says, okay, you believe that? Your brother will rise again. Martha said to them, Lord, I know he's going to rise at the last day. <laughs> we all know that there's supposed to be a huge resurrection at the end. I know that, Lord. He will rise again a thousand years from now. Two thousand, whoever knows how many thousands of years. Yeah, he's going to rise. Jesus peels the onion back right here. He says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, 
though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Why did he ask her that question? Let's look at her answer. The very next thing that he, she said after he asked his questions is she said to him, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, which should come into the world. That didn't answer his question. I asked you, and I told you that I am the resurrection and the life. And if a man believe in me, though he were dead, yet should he live. And if a man live and believe in me, he shall never die. You know, Jesus was actually the first one. That's where Paul gets that from. Where he says that we should not all sleep and we should be changed in a moment into another night. The dead in Christ shall rise first and we that are alive. Talks about how we'll be changed, right? Jesus taught that right here first. That there are people who will never taste death because they'll be changed. They will be alive at the time of the resurrection. Hold a second. I appreciate you, but I know you're telling me I need to lay I will lay it. Lord, this is good. All right, I got to pick out some pick and choose revelations that I'm going to give you now. <clears throat> she never answered the question. Do you believe that I'm the resurrection and the life? I believe you're the Son of God. That was her answer. And that's how many of us are. When God is trying to peel back this new layer, we can easily say that, yes, Jesus, you are the Son of God. But sometimes when situations and circumstances get bad and we've been burned because we received the word, but it didn't seem like the word worked for us, all we left with is, I still believe you're the Son of God. But I don't believe, in essence, that you're going to still move on my case. We'll never tell, tell them you're not the Son of God. But do we believe he'll move on our case? When Lazarus is dead? When I've been praying and none of my children love you? When I've been seeking you and you told me to, to do the work and it didn't prosper? But I received a word from you. <coughs> All of us have experienced that. Yes. But it's because God is trying to peel back a new layer in the realm of glory. So I'm glad to hear the land this thing. Now let me skip around. Eventually, Mary comes out. She says basically the same thing. If you had been here, Master, my brother had not died. Now this is a very interesting verse that you must pay attention to. When Jesus therefore saw the weeping, and the Jews also weeping, he came with her, and he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. You want to bother God? This word groan means that he snorted with indignation. He was angry about what he saw. He wasn't pleased. It gave him an uncomfortable feeling. Why? Because the Bible says that when he saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, he groaned in spirit and was troubled. He asked, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, come and see. And the Bible says, Jesus wept. Then they said, then said the Jews, behold now how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who have opened the eyes of the blind have caused this man that he should not have died? They wondered if he could even heal the man. Well, we know you, 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 you gave sight to the blind. I wonder if you could have caused him to not even have died. God said, I'm trying to take you deeper. It ain't even about me healing. 
How about me raising him up from the dead? That's much more powerful. You know what it takes to raise the dead? At that time, the spirits that died, of course, went to hell, which means you would have had to have power with God to not only restore a body that had begun to decay, but you would have also had to have loosed a spirit out of prison and caused it to come back into that body. That's a ridiculous, authoritative power that only God can control Amen. and deem. It's just like, it's like, you know, only the governor can give you a part. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you got a life sitting, only the governor can get you out. That's the kind of authority that was exercised here. So they say, could this man have even caused this man that he not die? Jesus again groaning in himself, coming to the grave. And it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. He groans when he see him crying. He weeps. And he groans again when they say, could he have saved him and stopped him from dying? What is bothering Jesus about all of this? All this weeping, all this crying, all this unbelief. The Jews said he cried because he was concerned. He wasn't crying because he was concerned. He knew he had the power to raise him up. Why would I need to be crying over this when I know it's well? Why would I, when a dead man to me is just sleep, why would I need to cry over it? They were crying because they were without hope. And he groaned at that. My friends, Mary and Martha, are weeping. I tell you the resurrection and life, and I ask you if you believe this and all, you can say, well, I believe you're the Son of God. No, do you believe I'm the resurrection? point to that last point was don't grieve God. When he give you a prophetic word, leave this earth believing it with 100% faith. And I don't care if you see everything die. If he have to raise you up from the dead to fulfill that word in your lifetime, he will do it. God, you said this thing was going to be this or this, this situation was going to really be this. I will go to my grave believe it, that you yeah. don't do this. Yes. Not die. And if you got to raise me up from the dead just to fulfill it, in my lifetime, you will do it. Because you are a God that keeps covenant. And you never lie. If you said that I would see the glory of God manifested in this, I'm going to see it. Don't offend him by crying and weeping and being all hopeless because you don't believe because the situation looked like it got worse when that thought it should have got better. Anyway, the story ends with Lazarus. God called Lazarus out of the grave. There you go. Click it down. You can play now, right? <laughs> That's fine. You can play now. You know, after all of that groaning that Jesus was doing, look at these sisters in verse 39. And this is how we are sometimes. Verse 39, it said, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha wants to counsel him now. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said to him, Lord, he stay. Are you out of your head? He's been dead four days, Jesus. He's thinking, hold up, Jesus. Don't you pull the stone back, Jesus. Come on, man. He's there. <laughs> Give this man some dignity, Lord. If you'd have been here, look at where that faith was. If you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. See, the Jews, they didn't even know if he could heal. Mary and Martha, they believed he needed to be there to heal them, which means I at least believe you can heal them. 
But this whole resurrection stuff after four days, hold up. That's another layer. That's another layer. Pull it back. She counsels him and says, Lord, he's saying, for he had been dead four days. And what was Jesus' answers? And Jesus said unto her, Said not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou wouldst see the glory of God. What did he do? He went back to the first word that I gave him. I told you, if you would believe me, you would have saw his glory. I'm not going to look at any more scriptures because I'm closing. got to contend with our faith like that. When God gives us a prophetic word, he is giving you a ticket that he's going to come to you today and, and do something for you. But before he do something for you, that means you may see things progressively get worse. But why does he do that? Because he wants to peel back the onion. I want to show you a new level of glory, a new revelation about God. The Jews believed we seen you here. We seen you give sight to the blind, but could you have healed? Mary and Martha, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. I believe at least you would have healed him. And I also believe you're the Son of God. But this resurrection business, that's another level. That's another lady. Oh, I believe you can do it. Five thousand years from now when the resurrection's come. This is one of the most powerful revelations I need you to get. And probably the last thing I'm going to say to you. Jesus has the power to do any miracle that you have read in the scripture and beyond right now. Right now. And God wants to invite you into new realms and new layers of glory. Don't say God you, raise, you, can, you can raise the dead. You're going to raise up 10 dead, thousands of dead, 5,000 years from now when the resurrection of that earth or whenever it happens. No, you say you are the resurrection in the life. And if you want to manifest that right now in my generation, in my life, you can do it. Who will believe that? Trouble. Prophetic word, a new layer of glory revealed. So look at your troubles now as an invitation to come pray. So that I can, Jesus can say, you know what I'm going to show you? That this is a new, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And I can manifest this right now in your life. You know when I read this now? This tells me that right now, I want to experience what Elijah experienced ascending into heaven in chariots of angels. I can't. It wasn't just for Elijah. It wasn't just for Jesus when he ascended into the, into the air. If I want to, if God want to invite me to, like I told you, the pool party, I'm going to step out into the, I'm going to step out on the water of the pool. You're going to see it. You can invite me into that. Can I have experience when I pray and because I'm in Christ, I see my own skin and it begins to shine like lightning? Not because of my own glory, but because the glory of God resides on the inside of me. And I see a cloud coming there and God talking about when he said, Jesus, this is my beloved son, I am well pleased. There are prayer meetings you can have and encounter that. Right now. I don't want to just hear about some man in the book of Revelations going to the third heaven. I want to experience it right now. So let the Lord invite you. Let him invite you. Whatever it is you're going to read in the word, whatever it is he speak to you, that's the invitation. I don't care what it is. Some of you will see words on deliverance. Some of you will see words on healings. Some of you will see words on diverse tongues. Some of you will begin to 
to read the supernatural miracles of how God used Elijah to call fire down from heaven. Who can believe God for that? God has the ability to do every one of those miracles right now in your life. Don't you put a limit on it. Father, we thank you even now in Jesus' name for this word.